uh, <laughs> I think everyone's still registered, so it must be the quality of the recordings. This is just so great. Um, so with any luck, no one will show up here in 15, 20 minutes and kick us out. Um, the, the topic of today is libraries. Um, first, we'll look at static libraries, how they work um, briefly. And then we'll look at uh, dynamic libraries, which is basically what everyone uses, more or less. Um, and that will also include position-independent code, which is a little bit of uh, a chapter of its own. Okay, so... Um, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, first? sure. So, uh, on, the, on the website it says to use the third bit as a third distinct bit as a marker, but Tim talked about using the second. Mm. The so I, I posted an answer on, on Piazza as well, but um, it's probably safer to use the third bit. Um, MMAP is using the second bit for... Sorry, Malik is using second, the second bit to indicate that a chunk is, was allocated using MMAP. Um, but we're not, in this template, we're not allocating large enough chunks that they will ever be allocated with MMAP. So both of them should work. I, I don't see how it can cause a problem. But the third bit seems like a the safer choice in, in general. On the other hand, if you're running on a 32-bit machine, you, of course you can't use the, the third bit. Uh, because uh, that makes everything 8 byte aligned and on a 32-bit machine you only get 4 byte alignment or I mean, you only care about 4 byte alignment so you would be actually removing 4 bytes from certain chunks if you do that, if you change the size by that so, so um, yeah, on a 32-bit machine you have to use the second bit, I suppose Okay, and uh, second question Basically, would we, when, we, when we're marking a chunk uh, because like when we say whether it's allocated or not, we go past it, right? And then the, the next kind of um, sub chunk tells me about the previous one, right? The next chunk tells tells you about the previous okay. one, yeah. So do we want to do the same thing with marking or, uh, or it doesn't matter? Or? I don't see a reason to do that with the marking. Okay. Uh, the reason that it, it's the next one for, for um, available, what was it called, for, like in use, the in use bit. That's so that you can know if you can traverse backward along the list. And you need to be able to traverse backward if you're doing coalescing. Of course, you would only coalesce two chunks if they were both free. So if the previous one is in use, then it doesn't matter that you can't go backward. But if it's free, then you need to know that so that you can go backward and do the coalescing without looking up in some other table somewhere and stuff that would be really slow. Um, in our case, we just want to see, oh, this exact chunk, should I free it? <coughs> so going and looking at some other chunks seems just like extra work. Yeah? Um, how many things do we have to Like with the root objects, how, how do we get all of them? I understand to get some of the stack, right? And how do you get all of the root objects? Yeah. Well, you, you want to traverse the whole stack. Like, just blow through the whole stack, pretending they were all pointers, every eight <coughs> bytes, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, yes, exactly. Run it through this pointer to see if that is... Uh, you don't know if they're pointers, right? So that's why I'm saying pretend. Uh, so you check it, pretend they're all pointers, and see if they point to one of the objects that you might be... Uh, that you're interested in, in uh, garbage collecting, right? Um, so you run through the whole stack and all of the global variables. How do you go through? Uh, same thing, you get a little uh, range. I, I thought yeah, Tim prepare, prepared a, yeah, so the static um, begin and end is somehow prepared in the, in the homework. I don't, I don't so remember. It's like set up, I guess. Yeah, so the start and last address they're provided for, for that. Uh, but, and then the d difficulty, I suppose, is you also need to traverse every chunk. Right, so you start with all the roots and you, then you get to some chunks. Now you need to traverse all those chunks to see if they have pointers to some other, some other chunk, right? to, to traverse the whole graph. And then make sure you don't end up in infinite loops, because right? you might have a pointer from there to there and go around. So you want to uh, keep an eye out for that sort of thing. Exactly. So, so if it's marked, you don't want to continue. OK, other questions on the homework? OK, so I. Um, Tim, I didn't actually do the solution for this homework, but Tim tells me that uh, 
the solution was really short, like on the order of tens, a few tens of lines, something like that. So um, what you want to watch out for is when you, when you start writing a lot of code, usually in these homeworks, I will probably let you know if there's a homework with lots of, of code. Right? Usually it's a more a question of trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe spend a lot of code trying to, trying to figure that out. <coughs> then you probably want to throw that out, and now you write those 15 lines that you need to, to finish the homework. Right? No, yeah, 15 lines. I don't know how many it is, but it's not, it's not going to be uh, 40. OK. Yeah, so 40, that's fine. That's a few times a lot, yeah. So it, it always depends on how you count, too. Like you count the semicolons. That's the classic. Count the number of, semi, number of lines with a semicolon in your code. Or maybe the, the number of semicolons, even. That gives you a very good estimate of the actual line count, because it won't have the commons. It won't have the free space. Um, it won't igno it'll ignore those little braces and things, stuff that don't really contribute to the difficulty of the code. OK, so the topic of today, um, last time we talked about the, the, just the basics of making an executable from some source files. Right? Now we have the extra challenge here of someone else, probably, is making a library for us. Right? So a library is a collection of binary objects. There's no sources here. It's just a collection of binary objects. And we want to link with that library. There's two kinds of libraries. There's a static, uh, which is a collection of .o files, or there's dynamic, which is a single .so file. Oh, in in uh, .a file. Okay, so this is actually the static here. This is actually like a zip file or a tar file or something. You can extract those files, those .o files again if you want. Um, whereas in a, uh, the dynamic library, that's similar to an executable. It's been linked, more or less. They're, they've done everything they can to ma make a single object out of it. Um, but then, of course, it needs to be linked to an executable if you want to actually run it. OK, so the static libraries are pretty straightforward because uh, you get these .o files, and if we have some .o, .o files, we know how to make an executable. And we have that executable as one big chunk, no one else cares, everything's one object, we have references, we know where everything's... Everything's going to be in the same place every time, it's very predictable. So you can just have some numbers there, there's nothing that you need to do on, at runtime. Just have a number saying, where in memory is this go variable going to be? And it will always be in that place in virtual memory, at least. Physical memory, of course, we don't know where it is, because that's... Uh, based on the page table, but as a process, we don't need to worry about that. So let's start with a with a static library. Now. So I thought, uh, as always, we'll do a a little bit of command line hackery here. So we'll go to my virtual machine just because I don't trust the the network. Um, so uh, we'll make uh, which class is this? Maybe lecture nine. Oh no. Go nine. Um, so I wanted to have a, a main that does something very simple. I want to call function one and I want to call function two. I, that's it, my main. And then uh, those functions are going to be part of a library. So uh, we need to also make a library here. So start with uh, function one, put that in here. Uh, let's have a global variable, just because this makes things a little more interesting. Uh, fun. Oh, printf. And what do we do? Uh, this is f1. Maybe I should do uh, i++ plus plus even. Looking good? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, a zero or one, who cares? But next time I run it, it'll print a one. Uh, next time I run it, it'll print a two. But of course, I only ran it once here, so. Um, OK, so that's the first one. And we'll have a uh, similar one. 
can't actually use another variable like that in the same well, actually in the same binary we wouldn't be able to do it. We could potentially, and I'm not going to go down that road here, but we could potentially have two global variables by the same name in the same library as long as we don't link with the same with both of those objects. So now I'm linking with both of the objects, it's going to pull in the, the globals, it's going to be a mess. So we'll just use the we'll just keep it simple and go like that. Okay, so to compile all this we'll go uh, All right. Okay. So there's a good start. Uh, let's ignore these things. Um, it's it's upset, of course, because I didn't include standard I/O. But then it didn't get partic it get, didn't get all that upset because it actually has a an internal um, implement uh, internal uh, printf that it uh, the GCC maintains for some performance reasons, and so that kind of makes things confusing. But anyway, now we want to make a library out of these. So instead of uh, making the single binary that we just did now, we want to keep the object files for these two, stick them in a library. To do that, we first make the object files. Uh, uh, I'll show you a little trick here. Uh, <laughs> so that expands. Actually, let's just do it again. Uh, <laughs> but I'll go like this instead. Um, Right, so it expands before echo runs. It expands this into F1 and then F2. Yeah. Well, what's echo? Echo is just print whatever I say. Right. Is there also print? All right. Okay. So it's good stuff. Is there a print? I don't think so. Maybe it. What is that? Okay, there is a print. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not go there either. Okay, there's lots of funny tricks like this in Bash. Uh, sometimes I give a lecture in in um, at the grad student seminars or sometimes department seminars on Bash hackery, but that's also for a separate um, lecture. So, okay, um, so we had some object files here. All right, now we want to make a library out of it. It needs to be a .dot a file. We can't use tar, but we can use r. <laughs> uh, the command that we want to we want to tell it q for create uh, q for add for some reason, c for create, and then s for make an index. You just say qcs. Um, here's our uh, functions a. That's what we want to uh, make a library out of, and then I'll just start at o. Okay. Um, so actually, let's try that as well <laughs> while we're at it. All right. So the star also, it's the same kind of expansion. It just replaces these arguments before it calls echo. Right. So that's exactly what happened here. AR doesn't know about the stars or anything. OK, so uh, <coughs> now I have a functions.a. Uh, and in fact, we can uh, take a look inside it if we want. Uh, I think it's t. And there, there are those uh, objects. Let's look at one more. I think we have a. In here, we should have a libc. Yeah. All right. So here we go. libc also has some .o files. Yeah. yeah. So printf will be in there. Q sort. Maybe you've used that in somewhere. A to I, you probably use that sometime. So they're all little C files that then got compiled into O files and it all got stuck into this libc. libc.a was how large? Three and a half megabytes. Um, and of course, if you were to link with all, .o, all those .o files, you would have a three and a half megabyte size file. That's not good. We, don't, we probably don't want that. Um, now, fortunately, with a .a file, it doesn't work quite like that. So now, if I use printf, and maybe printf uses a couple more functions in there, actually, printf probably uses a boatload of functions. But it, uh, say I use a to i. Um, now, when I link, actually, we haven't gone there yet. So let's do that first. Um, <coughs> so now I want to again make my main here. Let's see how large my main is. 
at that size. <coughs> okay, so that, that's, let's compile this main.c again. That doesn't work because we don't have the functions, right? So I could say f1.0 if I want. And then it'll find f1, right? I can say f2.0, but that's not what we wanted to do. We want to say functions.a, and now it pulled those out. But what's particularly nice about linking with the library here is it, it actually pulled out only those O files in there that I needed. So if I link with libc, and I'm using a2i, but I'm not using printf, then it's only going to link with that .o file, like the a2i.o file, which was probably small. And the printf one is probably huge. <coughs> so it makes for a relatively uh, small binary still. If I was, uh, if I wanted, I could, of course, link manually with that a2i.o, and it would be the same size. Uh, but usually you end up being lazy, so you just, you would include all the .o files in all of the C, and then you have a cr crap ton of stuff that you don't need in your function. So this is a nice way of being lazy. You get a nice package, and you make uh, binaries that are of reasonable size. So that's good. But then if you use a program, um, sorry, if you use libc fairly extensively, you use many of the functions, and those functions also, of course, use many of the other functions internally, so it's going to pull in everything that it needs, you might end up with most of libc in your program. So now we're going to end up with a fairly large, fairly large binary again. Now you have many programs on your computer, and every one of those has copies of this libc code all over the place, thousands of copies of the same code. So we're wasting space, of course disk is cheap, but also if you find a bug in libc, now you can, if you want to fix it, you have to recompile every program on your whole computer. Or use a dynamic library, dynamically loadable library, in which case you fix the library and all the programs that use this library immediately are uh, working as well, or that should be next time they start. They'll be uh, fine. Okay, so next topic then is the dynamically, actually, yeah, let's let's say the dynamically loadable libraries then. Question? Yeah. Uh, what's the new file size for linking the standard library as opposed to... Ah, it should be the same size. What was it before? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's just pulling out dot, those dot O's. Dot O's. Um, you should really think of the functions dot A as just a, a zip file. There's one more clever thing in the dot A. Actually, this might be a little larger than the sum of them. Yeah. See how that's that's two point some kilobytes? That's a little uh, two point three. So there's a hundred bytes extra in there, and that extra part, uh, of course, is going to be a little bit of regular overhead. But a neat piece that's in this dot a is there's an index that says for every symbol <coughs> in the whole library, so symbol being a function or a global variable, uh, for every symbol, which object file is it in? So why would we want that? Much faster searching. Yeah, so now you have, like for libc, you have a thousand files in there. Someone wants to link, they're just looking for a to i. You don't want to blow through the whole library reading all of those symbol tables to see if you can find some A2I. It'd be better to just look up in this index, get it right away, just pull out the right object file, link, and you're done. So that's how um, the static libraries do it. How is this any different from Pound Include? Oh, <laughs> it is extremely different from Pound Include. Um, so Pound Include, first of all, only operates on source. Right, so there are no sources here. This is done in objects. Uh, also, with pound include, you actually get a copy of all your sources. So if you pound include standard, standard I.O. in two different source files, if that was actually including the implementation of printf, you would get two copies of printf. But it doesn't. All it has is the header that says, like, oh, there exists a symbol called printf right, with these types and so on. Um, and then, so when you're compiling your binary, if, if the hash include, oh sorry, yeah, if this include would actually paste in all of printf, when you do your compilation, you would have the printf implementation inside of your .o file. But as it happens now, if we look at the, uh, uh, 
actually that's not a good one. Let's uh, look at f1.0. Uh, so here, for example, I didn't actually include it, but I could have. Actually, maybe I should do that just to, to be perfectly clear here. Uh, So now um, <coughs> our printf uh, that we called from f1 is not clearly not in this f1.0 because it's only a one kilobyte and printf is going to be at least tens of kilobytes. Um, so all we have is a reference here saying, okay, somewhere in here we need printf, but it's undefined. And it also says over here. Uh, here it says, oh, at offset 22 into my text, there's a reference to printf. I tried to call printf, but I don't know where it is. So when you link, help me find it. So linking is all about finding the implementations. And hash include is all about just getting the headers in so you know what, what exists, so to speak. You'll find one more thing there. If you, if you were to, in a .a file, .h file, if you were to include, say you just say, int i in a .h file. And now you include that file in two of your C program, uh, C uh, <coughs> files that you then compile into the same executable. You'll find that that .i is now declared twice. The dot, that int i is now declared twice, two different places, and it won't be able to compile. Because now it doesn't know, like, oh, if someone says i, which one do they need? Do they mean? Is it that i? Is it this i? So things don't exist in .h files from the purpose of the compiler. That's only the process. The preprocessor puts stuff from the .h files into the your .c, and then the .h's are forgotten. Okay, uh, where were we? Right. Right. So, so here, um, this is um, from a regular .o file. Um, we haven't linked it yet. It's a binary object, it needs linking. So here we can, when we then link it with a, a static library, we're able to uh, resolve this reference. We just tack the .o files together, we're able to resolve all the references, we just get numbers instead of these weird um, relocation entries. But with a dynamic library, it becomes a little different. So dynamic libraries, they have a, a couple of very interesting characteristics. This is an extremely elegant design, very flexible, um, and it's been around for ages, and it's probably going to st stick around too for a while. So um, and there's certainly, if that helps you uh, pay attention, there's certainly going to be some questions on this in the exam as well. So, um, so dynamically linkable libraries, or sorry, linkable or even loadable libraries. So these are shared objects between executables. So what does this mean? So an object, in this sense, is not like object-oriented programming, or, although it's eerily similar. Um, object is just a .o file. This happens to be a .so file, same story. So what's, cu what's cute and, and at the same time confusing about this situation is you have two programs and they're now going to use the same object and so how do you do that? Well they mmap, you, we said that before, you mmap your .so file into address space local okay each process mmaps okay all right so now the problem already be, has begun. When you mmap a file, you have control over where to put it, if you want. So that's fine. The process can know where this file ends up in memory. But the file doesn't know where it's going to end up. So you have some, you have an execut some executable code. It doesn't know where it is in memory. Because it's the same piece of code as mapped in by one process is mapped in at a 
A555 something, right? <coughs> and then some other program maps it in as B555 something. So now you have code that doesn't know where it's executing. It needs to be position independent. You can't jump like to some, some absolute address within your code anymore because you don't know where you are. So you have to, run to jump to a relative address. Okay, so let's let's put some uh, challenges here. The, the let's see, library code doesn't know it's where it is, where in address, where in memory it is. Okay, that's the first part. Also, this library code. It doesn't know where the global variables are. Right? So used to be you, you say, oh yeah, my global variable is going to be there. When I compile it, I know where I'm going to put it. It's fine. So first of all, it doesn't know where its own global variables are, whatever it declared. But that seems relatively easily uh, manageable. If we can manage not knowing where my code is, then we can certainly manage not knowing where my globals are. So we need to figure out, oh, what's the base address, right? And then deal with offsets instead. Okay. Don't know library code where globals are. Its own or external. Okay, so who's used the, the keyword extern in C before? Right. So good. So with an external variable, you say, oh, there exists a global variable by the name i somewhere. Like by the time we link all of this together, there will be a global variable uh, that's an int and has the type i. Um, but I'm not actually making a variable right here. So I don't know at the compilation time, I don't know where it is. Because I've just become this .o file and I have an undefined reference to some external i later on. And then during linking time, some other object comes in, it has the uh, variable i, and we replace the, the addresses, just like we do, do with the functions at linking. Of course, in a dynamically loadable library, it gets a little hairier than that, because now you have a, a shared library that's referring to a global variable that's in your executable, but there's lots of executables running at the same time. So how does it know, like, it doesn't even know which executables are going to be around. So how does it know where its eye is? Right. It needs to somehow figure out where those references are. So, yeah, or external variables. Okay. Um, moreover, when you start up your program, well, like I said, you know where the function is, but uh, you, you can potentially know where, not where the function is, but you can potentially know where the library is going to end up. Because you could ask for it. You can tell the mmap, I want it here. <coughs> Unfortunately, you don't know the internal layout of the library. Because as, as I said, we can change the library. Right? We can update the library between compilations of the executables. We can just update our library <coughs> to, uh, to fix some bugs. <coughs> which means our functions are not going to have the same spacing anymore. Right, maybe I added a little bit of extra code in one of the functions, now all the other functions have shifted down by a few bytes. So if I was to have in my program an absolute or even a relative reference to a function in the shared library, as soon as the library changes, everything, all bets are off. It's all broken. So executable or the program doesn't know the internal layout of the library to possible library updates. So when you link with a particular library, like with, with a dot .a, you kind of lock into that version, right? So now you know the exact structure. You can just, you can just make this one big uh, binary blob. But in this case, uh, we don't know what version of the library we're actually going to be running. So we're kind of out of luck there. Um, and of course, the program also doesn't. So this um, includes both 
function offsets and global variables. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, okay, so I suppose that's the that's the main thing. Um, so now what we have to do is at some time at some point at runtime. At runtime, we know what version of the shared object we have. So at runtime, we can fix our program. We start our program, and now we can rewrite. We know where all our undefineds are, uh, potentially. And now we could rewrite the whole program along the way, do a dynamic linking sort of on the fly, change all of our references to point to the right place, and now would be good. The problem with this is it's kind of slow. Right? You might have a large program. We only deal with small programs in class. But if you have a program that's um, megabytes or hundreds of megabytes, it's a lot of linking. And it's a lot of work to go through all this just because you want to start this program. Um, so, and then you might end up just, you know, you open up the program, you change this, this word, let's say. Right? So you're starting a word. It's a huge beast of a program. You change one letter, right, and then you save it and you quit. Right, so now you've done enormous amounts of work to get the program going, just to use two functions in the whole program, so to speak, and then um, you quit. So now we've done a lot of extra work that we didn't really have to. It'd be better if we can have a lazy mechanism, so we only resolve references when we actually need them. But then it also needs to be fast. So, okay. So the basic solution here... Um, is that all references remain symbolic in some sense until they're used. So what do we mean by this? Well, there's a, for, every, for every call we make, for every reference to a global variable we use, um, we don't talk directly, we don't expect our code to have a direct reference to where it is. Instead, we're going through some indirection. We're going through a table in terms of the uh, uh, global variables, it's called the global offsets table that maps uh, some symbol to its current location. Alright, so uh, in this case, if we have a function, our f1, right, the global offset table ought to say, where is this f1? Okay, but of course there's a lot of work to create the offset table, so we really want to populate it lazily. So we have one extra step to make that happen, and this is called the um, process, no, 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 procedure lookup table. So in a procedure lookup table, it's not actually a, a, a table, and uh, I think we'll have time to go through a little bit of disassembly here to see how it actually works. There, we have a, a lazy update, or lazy update of the GOT. Okay, so the first time, if you're calling a function, a dynamically loadable function, uh, what's going to happen is you actually don't call that function. You call into <coughs> this lookup table. You call into an address in some table instead. And usually, I'll just hold up a little bit. Uh, and th there's code in there. So uh, usually, if everything's uh, already up and running, that's going to jump immediately to where the actual function is. But if we don't know where the function is, then it's going to instead jump to a resolution function that figures out where the function is and puts the right address of the function in the global offset table. Okay, so we'll see how this all works in, in code momentarily. You had a question? Um, how are these related to symbol table? So symbol table is used for describing in an object like which symbols are in there and which do we still need. Um, so I suppose in some sense you could say that the global offset table has one for every and an, an entry for every symbol that's not yet resolved, like in, in your objects. So it's a, maybe a list of symbols in 
in some way. There's an like, example table somewhere for just a program where this is for... Symbol table is for an object. An executable doesn't need a symbol table. Um, but if you have an executable that relies on a dynamically link linkable library, you still need to have some way of finding those symbols. And this, the global offset table sort of helps up helps out with that, but it only exists during runtime. It's not in the binary. Symbol type table uh, sits in the ELF binary, right? whereas this sits in memory. It's uh, something that happens at runtime. But we'll see it uh, very shortly now. So first of all, um, and I think we'll, we'll spend uh, a, at least part of next lecture on this stuff as well. But let's start by uh, seeing what happens when we compile some code in a position independent way, right? So there's a problem. The initial problem here was we, our library code doesn't know where it's going to end up in memory. So it needs to be different somehow. And it's particularly, particularly interesting on 32-bit uh, machines. So this happens to be a 32-bit virtual machine. So we'll, we'll look at that instead, instead of a 64-bit, where there's such nice facilities in the hardware that it makes the code quite similar. Um, so now let's think a look at our F1. So F1, if you recall, is uh, calling printf. It's subtract adding one to a global variable and then calling printf. <laughs> so here's this funny bit, right? This is still in an object. So we're calling 22, which is right after here. And that's because this is an unresolved symbol reference. This is our printf. We don't know where printf is. We're just an independent object so far. OK. Um, what are we ha what's doing more here? This is the preamble, right? We're manipulating the stack and so on. And then finally, we're, uh, let's see, what are we doing here? Yes, so here we're, ah, right, good. So here, we're moving 0, 0, to EAX. No, it's not 0, 0, we're moving 0 to EAX. That's not what we wanted here, I think. We wanted the, the value of this global variable. But we haven't actually decided where the global variable is going to end up in memory yet. It hasn't been linked. So this is also not yet resolved. If we look at the, uh, at this here, we'll see there's some relocation entries. At number 7, at address 7, we're saying, oh, i is what we're referring to at address 7. So when you link, you're going to have to replace whatever is at address 7 with a pointer to uh, or or uh, is it the pointer to? Yeah, pointer to uh, our i. So what does it look like here? Uh, looks to me like this would move the value. So number seven, anyway, that's this, right? Here. So that's where we're going to put it in. I. A little unclear on, oh, there's the address, and then we're doing what exactly? Yeah, I'm, I'm unclear on why this in immediate move is not, uh, like, shouldn't it be a reading from memory? I'm just wondering how you can move EAX into zero. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so that's the same thing. This zero, 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 that's the second relocation uh, entry. Okay. At 11, I thought we had one. That's the second relocation entry at 11 i thought we had one Right, the 11, it says, okay, replace whatever values at 11 with whatever you decide i is going to be at. Right. So it's rewriting. This is not an executable. It's just a binary object. Okay, so those two zeros are going to be replaced. But maybe I'm misremembering the assembly syntax here. Ah, that's what it is. If you don't, if you don't put a dollar before, it's actually a, a move from this memory address. If you put a dollar, then it's an immediate move. Okay. There we go. So, uh, so get the value of i, put it in eax, and also put it in edx, um, and add one to i, and so on. Okay. So that's what printf is doing. This looks very reasonable to me. Now let's see what happens if we want it to be position independent. So I give it a flag, pic position independent code, and we'll check out the same thing again. Okay, so it got a little bit bigger. 
Much of it looks about the same. Well, some of it looks the same. <laughs> so this is our printf call toward the end. Uh, the, the preamble looks similar, except here we're saving EBX for some reason. We're going to use EBX for something more, something new here. This is actually going to be our base register to figure out like, where does my library start? Like, what's the base for everything? And we're de dealing just with offsets from the start instead. So now when we want to refer to our I, um, we're doing, here it is. See, now we're moving something to EAX again. But what we're really moving to it is uh, some offset off of EBX. So we're we don't know the absolute address. EBX is our base address. How do we get this base address? Well, we're calling a function here. <coughs> this function is fetching, somehow figuring out where our base address is, and then um, putting that in EBX. Actually, if we look for, let's see, 7, the relocation entry, we should uh, get something interesting there. Relocation entry for 7, or 8, sorry, there. So, get PC thunk. So, that's the, uh, get the the uh, program counter, like the beginning of where our uh, uh, I don't know why it's called thunk, but wherever the, the, the beginning of the library is. All right, so that gets stuck in, in uh, EBX, and then everything else becomes relative references now to EBX. It's still a zero. That's probably going to change. I don't know. Maybe not. We only have one. So it could maybe actually be, be fine. Why doesn't do the Let's see. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Probably the EBX is off by two because the first two is something else that we're not interested in here. I, yeah. That's curious. Anyway, let's see. At uh, 14, do we have a relocation reference for entry for 14? Yeah, yeah we do. So it's going to decide later on where i is going to be relative to EBX this time. So just as a reminder here, why do we need uh, to do stuff relative to e EBX? Because we don't know where the library is. Exactly. And not only that, the library is actually running in several <coughs> programs at the same time. So we can't just go and change the library code. You can imagine that too. Right? When you're linking, just change the code in memory. But it doesn't work because you have multiple different programs all depending on the same code. So you can't do it. So now you have all these different programs. Whenever they call var f1, <coughs> they then call this function here, get thunk, whatever, which figures out where we are. And so then all the code can remain the same. They never change the code um, between executables. All right, so we have the thunk. So unfortunately, this library call gets a little slower, right? Because now we have to make two function calls and do a little bit extra work. So a dynamically loadable library isn't always as fast as, um, as a straight compiled one. There are other reasons for that, too. Um, OK, so let's see how we make one of those dynamically load loadable libraries. And I don't think we'll have time for the offset table and so on. And we'll do that with maybe with drawings even uh, next time. But let's see how we just at least put together one of those libraries. So uh, what do we have here? First, we need to compile with pick, right? Uh, both F1 or, and F2. Yeah, I just didn't include standard IO and F1 and F2. All right, so now we have both of those are position independent code. If we read ELF this, we'll see that it's position independent. See how it grew a little bit? Right? Position independent code is a little bit slower and a little bit bulkier. Okay, so now we want to make a shared library. It's not as complicated as, as it seems. Just say shared f1 dot o f2 dot o and then save it to functions dot so all right so this all that this thing here does is say we don't actually want an executable right what we want to get out is a shared library so there will be some slight differences in between a shared library and an executable there but they're very similar main thing is that the, all the code has to be position independent. Would you have been able to just use some kind of command for GCC shared 
as functions a dot uh, or functions dot a to functions dot so. Oh, converting a dot a to dot so. That do, wouldn't make any sense. Because in a dot a, you would always have position dependent code, the most efficient. Um, and so converting the binary position dependent code into position independent, I mean, it's, maybe it's doable, but it seems very difficult compared to just doing it from the source. So you could actually go straight to, here I'm doing it one step at a time, but you could also go like this. Uh, but then I have to, if I want this to actually work as a dot .so, I have to make sure it's, it's uh, position independent code, so it'll be like that. <coughs> okay, that should work. So now finally, let's compile our program. Compile like that, doesn't work, right? But I can compile it with functions.so, and now we can run it. Let's try running it. Uh, a dot out, doesn't work. Huh, it can't find functions.so. Any idea why? It's not in the path, right. It's like if I'm trying to run some program, I type some name and it's not where it's supposed to search for, for programs. So we need to add functions, either put functions.so in slash lib, or in user lib, or in user local lib, one of those that are in the path, or we can cheat a little bit. We say ld library path equals dot, so that we say also include the, the current, um, current path. So now it all happened. Let's check one more thing here. LDD a dot out. LDD just tells us what libraries does this thing really rely on. So what does it want? It wants libc, it wants functions.so, something else. Okay, maybe we should get out of here. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, sort of a pretend library. It doesn't actually exist. It's a pretend library for all of the system calls um, that's provided by Linux. Okay. So uh, good luck with the homework, and I will see you.